morning. This is my second time at Open Source Bridge. It's my first time speaking here, so I'm really excited. I currently work and live in San Francisco, and I work at a small, dirty person cloud computing startup called uh, Piston. And uh, Piston makes cloud OS software that automates an entire private cloud environment on x86 commodity servers. So in other words, it's, uh, it's very uh, based on OpenStack, but we also support Hadoop and Spark. So as of three weeks ago, we got acquired by Cisco. <laughs> so, so like this is a whole new world order. And technically, I'm supposed to be at like a new employee orientation day that started about like literally a minute ago, but in San Francisco. But I told my manager that I had a prior commitment, so I'm here. <laughs> okay, so but um, you raise your hand. Um, so how many of you have started like learning Git in the past six months, nine months? Okay, cool. So about like a quarter of the people. Cool. All right. So pretty much when you first learn how to um, do you get, you first go through um, setting up configuration files, like that's literally like step zero of like learning Git. So um, learning how to do Git config files is really important and it can save you a lot of time. Git aliases help you type out shortcut commands, so instead of typing out the entire full long uh, Git command, you can put in the snippet into your Git config file and you can start typing out like the, yeah, the shortcut codes. Uh, color coding your working directory is pretty useful too. So you can uh, add this snippet into your git config, and every time you type in git status, you can have, say, your untracked files be color coded, and the file, your modify files be color coded, and also the changes to be committed. So this it's kind of helps me visually organize like what's going on in my working directory. Eventually, you'll run into really long branch names, and this is when you can use, uh, you can put in a tab autocompletion bash script, like into your bash RC. The instructions for setting this up is really different for every operating system. And uh, once you've got that set up on your bash RC, you can um, go into any remote or any Git directory and start like doing auto tab completion. And, and it helps for like any, on any Git command on any branch name. You can also make your bash prompt more useful and uh, this is an example of a very fancy bash prompt that I got off the internet. And it shows the current branch, the current directory. Um, you can also customize your bash prompt to show the Python virtual environment that you're in and the status of the working directory. Um, you can also manually de uh, decide to edit the PS1 variable in your bash um, RC to like, manually configure like, your bash prompt to show some useful information. So all of these are useful starting points for configuring your personal Git config. I mean, literally everyone's personal Git workflow will be different and they'll all have different Git configs. So this is just a starting point. Okay, so I assume that after some like X number of weeks or months of learning Git, you're familiar with using Git add for adding files into a staging directory. You're familiar with checking the status of the working directory. You can push your branch to a remote repository. You can also fetch branches and uh, other people's work using Git fetch. So by the end of this talk, I hope um, y'all get more familiar with dealing with mistakes in Git. So in particular, I'll be covering these really four commonly used but often very confused commands. All right, so this is a really brief Git 101 like review. So first, you make some changes to files in the working directory, which is a single checkout of one version of your project. Then you can stage the files by doing git add, which marks the files as modified but not yet committed. Uh, then finally, you can also make a commit, which takes a snapshot of those files in your working directory, and like, basically you create an entry in the rough log saying that you've made this um, commit. Um, so once you've finished like, doing your work, you have a number of commits, and then at the end, you would typically push all those commits to a remote repository on a code hosting site like GitHub. Okay, so um, Git is, Version control is really useful for collaboration, and so typically you would have a, more than one developer working and sharing code and fetching code from this one single source of truth, the upstream master remote. Um, in this case, it's labeled origin. And um, when you get used to Git, you would get used to having different remotes that would each point to a different person's repository. And you'll get used to fetching from different remotes and fetching other people's branches, and you'll also get used to uh, pushing changes from 
um, your, uh, from your own branch to other people's branches. So that's, this is all part of like the collaborative workflow. Okay. Um, so this talk is all about mistakes and how to fix them. A lot of blog posts that you'll read are posts on Stack Overflow will assume that like fixing a mistake or learning Git is straightforward and easy, and oftentimes that's just not the case because oftentimes Git can be, um, it's confusing because there's actually more than one way to do anything in Git. <laughs> so that was, yeah. And um, to be honest, I, I think that learning how to fix mistakes is, um, is a mostly like trial, by er trial and error process. I feel like to really understand like Git, it's, uh, you have to make mistakes on real code bases, like sometimes accidentally, sometimes catastrophically. And that's the only way to know what not to do. <laughs> All right, um, so also as like um, a footnote, uh, there, there are very, very few ways, like very rare ways to make permanent mistakes in Git. So I'll cover ways that you can make permanent mistakes in Git like later on. <laughs> All right, um, so this is a decision tree of like all the different um, like dots, like different like uh, ways that you know, if you get stuck, like what do you do? So it can be really confusing and intimidating if you're like, somehow stuck in the middle of this and you're not sure like what is the best course of action. Um, so hopefully by the end, like you'll figure out, you know, I'll, you'll have the tools to figure out like what, how to get back to the state where everything is fine. You'll notice that in the like red label danger zone, um, git rebase interactive and git force push are like one of the danger zone, um, like are labeled as like dangerous things that you can do. So I'll just start off by talking all about git rebase. All right, so when you first push your git, um, your branch to GitHub, sometimes you'll see that the merge pull request button is completely grayed out. The reason is because uh, while you're working on your branch or doing all your work on your branch, other people on your team are also doing work on their branches and they're getting their commits merged into the upstream master. And so the reason for this grayed out button is that like, you basically need to have all of those upstream commits uh, copied over onto your own personal branch. So git rebase is really useful for reordering commits. Um, and in short, git rebase puts all of your local commits on top of the upstream branches commits to make for a really linear and clear history. The other second thing that Git Rebase can do is that you can use the interactive flag to change and reorder the history on your local branch. Okay, so this is the simplest use case for Rebase. Uh, so to define some terms, master is the upstream branch and it is a branch that which production software is released from. So um, in this case, uh, master is all these different commits like A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime that other people have made to the upstream branch and other developers can have personal branches off of the master branch. So in this case, um, I just call this personal branch develop, and this is a branch off of master. So ultimately develop, uh, this branch develop is supposed to be merged back into master eventually after the work is like all done and co-reviewed and all the tests pass. So, um, so in order for the develop branch to be merged in into master, um, all of the commits, A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime, need to be copied over directly onto the develop branch. The end result should look like this, ideally. So now you have a really linear history, like pretty much rebase assumes that um, all of the commits that you've done are like now on top of like your, um, the master commits. People often ask, what is the difference between a rebase and a pull, and when should you do either? In short, you should not use a pull. For doing, for either case, you really end up with the same result, but git pull puts in a merge commit, and um, the merge commit basically states that you're merging this branch into this other branch. And um, that can get quite cluttered when, say, like, if you're a project maintainer, you are merging all these different pull requests, each pull request will have its own merge commit. So that can easily get really confusing and messy very quickly. Uh, so <clears throat> git, git pull, um, technically, um, unifies two lines of development, but the, the reason for git pull is that um, it preserves the ancestry of the commit, so that's why you have a merge commit. And then rebase uh, reorders commits, so that way all of your local commits are now on top of uh, the upstream commits. All right, so in short, uh, avoid doing a git pull. All right, so I'm gonna go deeper into rebases and branching. So, so we know we have the master branch, and this is where uh, production software is released from. 
uh, I'm going to introduce the idea of a feature branch, which um, for the purpose, it's, um, it's basically another upstream branch. They give it as yet another like master-like branch that which other developers can fetch and rebase from. And uh, other like contributors in the code base can decide to create branches off of the feature branch and then merge those changes back into the feature branch, or they can also have branches off of the master and then have those changes merge back into the master branch. So in this case, um, as for our Tor example, we have the develop branch, that's a branch off of the feature. And so you can see that there's two rebases that need to happen. Uh, the feature branch needs to be rebased against master, so all of those like green label commits need to be copied over to the feature. And similarly, the develop branch needs to be rebased against the feature branch. Basically, all of the commits A, B, C, D, and E need to be copied over to the, to the develop branch. All right, so this is the end result when you do a rebase of the develop branch against the feature branch. So you see that all of the yellow label commits are now on top of like A, B, C, D, and E. So this is the ideal um, fast forward rebase. And you do that using either one of these two syntaxes. You can give the source branch master slash feature followed by the destination branch, which is the develop. Alternatively, you can, get, you can do a get rebase onto where you can go, you can specify the order of the rebase from left to right. So in this case, master, feature, um, develop. So in either case, um, you have a, you, after you've done a git rebase, you have this like, really clear like, commit history of like, all the commits that you're, you're doing. All right. So this is another example where this gets a little bit trickier because you have two upstream branches, the master branch and the feature branch. And both of these branches are remote branches that are shared by other contributors on a team and they fetch and, re, like, pull, uh, fetch and rebase from either. So, um, so in this case, eventually feature branch is supposed to be a, a branch that has a lot of different commits on it, and eventually it is also supposed to be get merged in into master. So um, in order for that to happen, you have to do a rebase. So ultimately, this is the end result of the feature branch, where you have all these like blue label commits on top of like the, um, the green label ones. OK. The, the tricky thing about this particular rebase is that because both of these are upstream branches, they, um, every, everyone who has a branch off of either master, uh, feature or master would have to do a rebase um, because they're downstream. And um, they, they would also need to get all the latest changes from master, uh, from master or feature because all these upstream branches have changed. Eventually, as you start getting more familiar with rebase, you'll inevitably run into rebase conflicts. And you can tell when you have a conflict when you have like conflict in all caps, like everywhere on your screen. <laughs> all right, so fixing a rebase conflict is um, not terrible. And it's just, you pretty much can fix a rebase conflict the same way you can fix a merge conflict or a uh, cherry pick conflict, a revert conflict. The reason why conflict happens is because Git thinks that there's two different versions of the file in the same part of the code in the same, in the same file. So to fix, so let's go over how to fix a rebase conflict. First you locate the conflict marker and you go directly into the file, you open up the file in your command line or editor and then you make edits to resolve the file by either like deleting the conflict markers and you can decide to keep uh, one version of the file while also deleting the other version of the file that Git is confused about. You can resolve the conflict by doing git add file name to mark it as resolved, and you do git based continue to let um, get know that you're going to go move on to the next step. And sometimes you might run into more conflicts with the next commit, and then you have to pretty much repeat steps one, two, and three. Alternatively, you can decide to not do a rebase at all. It's totally legit to do a git rebase re abort because there are other situations where you might not, you may not really need to do a git rebase to get all of the latest commits from upstream. So these are two examples where you don't really need to do a git rebase to get all those upstream commits. And so you'll, you'll see that there's more than one way to do, to do anything in git. Right. Yeah. So let's move on to git rebase interactive. Um, git rebase interactive is a really powerful tool in git. And you can use it to reorder and change the order of the commits in your local branch. So it is super powerful and super useful. You can give it a hash, so the rebase uh, would start from the given hash all, uh, up until the most current commit. You can also give it the 
um, the number of commits away from the most recent commit by indicating the number of caret signs like on top of head. Eventually, over the course of a project, you'll make a whole number of commits, some of more useful commit messages than others. And over and at the end of the project, typically what you would do is you would do a squash rebase where you would um, take all these very large, sprawling number of commits and uh, squash them into smaller, more coherent commits with clearer uh, commit messages. So this is where you would do a git rebase. <laughs> all right, so when you type in your terminal, git rebase dash i, head squiggly five, you, the terminal pops up and you see the last six commits that you've done on your local branch. Um, Unintrivially, all of the most uh, recent commits are at the bottom, but the most, uh, the oldest commit is actually at the top. So, so here you can do a number of things. You can uh, squash a commit by like changing the PICK with like the letter S to, to squash to select a commit with the commit right above it. You can decide to edit the commit message by like um, taking out the PI, like pick, replacing pick with like the letter E to let Git know that you want to edit the commit message, and that will cause um, get to pause, and you can um, start changing the commit message. You can outright delete an entire commit by like deleting a line in here. So once you've reordered everything in the way that you want it to be, you can save and quit out of this terminal, and Git pretty much applies all of the commands that you've told it to do uh, from the oldest to the most recent. All right, Git reset. Uh, pretty much sets your branch to a different part of the local commit history. And this is really useful for undoing any changes. So, um, so for example, if I were to like work on a project and I decided to go one direction, and then I decided, that, well, maybe this is like not the right approach, then doing a git reset is a good way to undo your changes and just like start over. Okay, so let's say I want to undo my, the last commit because like maybe I forgot to put something, uh, I forgot to put a file or I forgot to remove a file, I just wanna like redo that last commit. I can do a git reset soft, which puts all of the last um, commits file changes into the staging area, and now my current branch points to the previous commit. And all of the change files are now in my um, staging area, and there are like changes to be committed. So you can do a whole number of things at this point. You can either do a git reset head to unstage the file, you can, um, start adding files or deleting files, and pretty much you can just like, reformat this commit and remake the commit exactly as you want it with a new commit message. So um, just the other option, really popular option for get reset is get reset hard, and this is the option that you can use to literally clear everything in your staging area. It abandons all the changes. And it causes <coughs> the current branch to point to the previous commit, and uh, most importantly, it's it's one of those very few commands where you can lose changes permanently if you don't, if you're not familiar with using git reset hard. Um, so if you use a git reset hard, like, there's a number of cases where I can think where using git reset hard is really useful. Uh, for example, if you're doing a rebase and you have a whole lot of merge conflicts or uh, rebase conflicts, you can use a reset hard to pretty much, okay, just like clear everything and start over and it's the same as doing, that would be the same as doing a git rebase abort. If you know, for example, you want to remove the last n number of commits from your local history, you can also do a git reset hard like n number of times to remove those commits. And you'll see that git reset is like super useful when you use it with git ref flag. The git ref flag shows you the read only commit based history of all of the actions taken on your machine. So every time you do a git um, branch switch, you create a new branch or if you do a rebase, if you do a reset, if you delete a branch, create a new branch, like anything that involves uh, storing, creating new data, uh, creates a new entry in the ref flag. Um, and this is really useful because uh, this, uh, you, you're pretty much, you pretty much have the freedom to go back to any commit that has been done at any point of the Git history. Um, so Git can be really powerful in that way because it, it allows you to make experimental changes and you can always go back to a previous known good state. So even if your branch may not have code that works or if it has tests that fail, you, can all, you know that you can always go back and step back and go to a previous state where you know things are gonna work. All right, so there, here are some really useful 
uh, flags for ref log. So on the left, you can see this is the regular output of the ref log with the hash and also the action that was taken. You can use the grep flag to search the commit messages by keyword. So for, in this example, you see all of the messages have the letter, uh, have the word revert in it. Uh, the all flag would show you the name of the branch and the name of the stash. The date flag shows you the timestamp of each action. So imagine if you accidentally did a git reset hard. This is like an example, for example. Um, and you did reset hard on the last three commits. So now your most current recent commit is a commit with, that begins with AC44, like yeah, the one labeled in red. Um, in order to undo this particular action, you can look at git ref log and see what was the commit that happened before you did, it do, uh, before you did the git hard reset, which is like ASEX 4 b zero, yes, label in red. And then you can do git reset hard with the hash in order to go back to that previous state. So reflog is a really good way to bring back to life lost commits. And um, another useful thing for, you, for reflog is that if you squash too many commits together into a single commit, you can undo what you did by looking up the reflog and going back to that previous state where it was all good. Um, if you've accidentally ever deleted branches in your forking directory, you can also restore them <coughs> by using the reflog. All right, so after you have the commit hash from the rough log, you can do a whole number of things. You can, um, and get, you can create a new branch out of that commit. You can reset your branch to a, for a previous state. You can cherry pick that lost commit on top of your current branch. All right, so the next thing is the, the revert command. When you type in git revert and into hash, um, this terminal opens saying that you're going to revert this particular commit with this um, hash and the commit message, and revert affects only a single commit and creates a new uh, revert commit message. And uh, it's, revert is really uh, useful in that, like if you want to just target one commit and you know that say like a bug is being caused by that one particular commit, then um, instead of manually going about and like changing the files, you can do git revert to have, to have this automatically be done for you. Okay. You can specify changes to revert. Uh, so just for in this example, you want to revert the fourth class commit away from head. Similarly, you can also get revert conflicts if the commit that you want to revert has a conflict with a commit from the future. So, <laughs> so, so fixing the conflict is the same as you would fix, um, like is the same way as you would fix any other kind of conflict. You can. I'll look at the conflict markers, resolve them, um, add the files, and then um, do re revert continue and then move on to the next conflict marker, if any, until all of the conflict markers are resolved. Okay. So one really common question people have is, what is the difference between a reset and a revert? So if you want to make large changes in your local Git history, uh, know that Git revert only affects one commit, and if you really want to affect multiple you want to like really reorder your commits and like affect multiple changes, like multiple commits. Uh, git reset is the one to use, and for that reason, uh, you should use git reset typically on a private, like local branch that's not shared with anyone else. And uh, git revert is really useful for um, doing for reverting commits on a public shared branch in general. Sorry, I'm gonna cover some um, ways to make permanent mistakes in Git so you know what not to do. All right. So let's say you have some changes uh, that are in your staging, they're ready to be committed, but they don't have a commit yet. And then all of a sudden you do a git reset hard. And that pretty much clears everything in your working directory, like everything. And as a result, when you do git status, there's nothing in your working directory, it's totally clean. And so there's really no way you can get back this like you, you have not made a commit, so there's no like storage, there's no entry in a rough log at all. And so uh, it's just totally a permanent mistake. You would just have to like manually remember what you change and we, we do it. Um, the other permanent mistake you can make is doing a git force push of your local branch into a remote branch. And this causes, so what this says is that it's, it's doing, um, it's rewriting the remote branch's history with your own local branch's history. And this is a permanent change. And you can't really, 
go back to it unless, for example, you have like a branch stored of that particular remote branch, then you can use a ref log to rewind back to it. But for the most part, like this is a pretty dangerous command to use and it should only be used on your like local branch instead of a shared remote branch. All right, so in summary, if you run into any of these, uh, any Git problems, I think the solution is mostly to use one of these commands, like rebase, reset, ref log, uh, revert. So um, my, my next part of this talk is about automating some Git commands, but before I do that, does anyone have questions about any of these, like anything in the talk? Uh, yeah? So after a git rebase, um, a lot of times your local branch uh, says that it's diverged from your remote branch, even when you're dealing with your own private repository. Um, how do you push that up there other than with the force push? Oh, yeah. I think that that's one of the cases where you know that you would, I, I typically do that because like, if my branch has diverged from master, like I would either do a rebase, if that didn't work, like I would push, force push my own local branch up onto my own like, um, mas like master remote. So that, I tend to do that a lot. <laughs> okay, um, any other questions about, okay. or you can save questions later, that's fine too. Right. Over time you'll um, run into a lot of different routine things that you'll do in Git. So one of the routine things I tend to do in Git, um, oh before, just to back up, um, I'm, I'm going to um, introduce the idea of like using the IPython notebook to do some Git commands. So. Typically, like, um, I'm not sure if anyone has ever used the IPython notebook, but it, I realized like, over the past year that it does support git commands as well as a number of like, bash commands. So that's pretty useful. Um, one of the repetitive things I, I tend to do over time when I accumulate a lot of like, dead and active branches is that I start deleting local branches on my working directory. I can use a um, IPython notebook script to pretty much like automate this. I hard code some branches I want to delete and then um, I use a for loop to go through all of those branches and delete them. All right. This is another really common operation. I typically would CD into a project directory. I would fetch from a remote, then do a rebase of that remote against my current branch and I do that again for another project. So, uh, so here I can use a um, notebook script hard code the list of projects and pretty much have the notebook do that for me automatically. And this should be the end result. So this is just a brief uh, footnote of like an additional tool that you can use if you ever want to avoid writing bash scripts and you can have an IPython notebook script. I have not figured out a way to run IPython notebook scripts like on the command line. So at this point you would have to install the entire notebook and then open a new notebook and then go into a cell and run code. That's how you can run code in it. All right, I think that's all I have. <laughs>